Hello, everyone. I am Father Steve Katsuris. I am um, uh, the Come to Believe Foundation and Network. And I'm delighted today to talk to my friend and colleague, Dr. Julie Sullivan. Julie is the president of the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. I'm going to be talking about uh, the two-year college at St. Thomas, the Doherty Family College. Julie, welcome. And uh, we've always had great conversations, and I know this one will also be a terrific conversations for our listeners and viewers. So, Julie, talk to us about the origin story story for DFC for Doherty Family College. You know, um, I know it was based on your experience of observing a root bay college. So, how did you learn about a root bay, and then how did that lead you to say we're going to go forward with Doherty Family College? Sure. So thanks again for having me. I look forward to this chat. And, um, you know, it goes back to my first year at St. Thomas. I arrived new to Minnesota, new to the University of St. Thomas in July of 2013. And I was learning a lot about St. Thomas and who we served in terms of our student community. And I had a desire to really expand the profile of students that St. Thomas was serving, at, particularly at the undergraduate level. And I was particularly focused on a, uh, a wider profile in terms of first generation students, low socioeconomic students, how could we serve more? Uh, and then I also was getting to know the business community. Uh, I was you know, meeting all the CEOs of the uh, large firms in the community, joining a lot of business and civic organizations and really learning of the future workforce needs that we have in the Twin Cities and in Minnesota, and also learning really about the glaring uh, education opportunity and prosperity gaps that exist in Minnesota. And I really felt like St. Thomas had to find a way to put our oar in the water to address this. If we're supposedly a university about advancing the common good, and we have glaring gaps and inequities in our own community. What is our role? How can we play a role? So I'll never forget uh, during the first few months I was here, I was actually having lunch on a terrace in downtown Minneapolis with the CEO of one of the large firms here. And he said to me, so Julie, what is your dream? And only the way he can say that. And I said, you know, and I'm looking up at the skyscrapers all around me and I said, See all of those windows? 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I want the people that you see through those windows to reflect the richness of this community and this state, the richness in terms of the racial and ethnic diversity, the richness in terms of socioeconomic diversity. And then I said, and I want them all to be Tommies. <laughs> so, you know, these were the things that were in the back of my mind as you know, I'm having conversations. And the origin of finding a root bay came from a conversation with uh, some leaders of the National Network of Cristo Rey. Uh, they were visiting me in December, 2013 in my office. I had all of these things in my mind. And I'm talking to them about you know, the great work they do in preparing their students to graduate from college, excuse me, graduate from high school and go on to college. But we're also talking that you know, th there's some leakage in the pipeline. Not all of those students that graduate from Cristo Rey are, are ready to enter a four-year program. Some need some, a continuation of some of the nurturing and wraparound supports that you often find at Cristo Rey. Uh, and so how do I play a role in preventing the leakage in their pipeline? And I was talking to them about that. And they said, well, you know, they're doing something at Loyola there's a program called Arupe, and it sounds a lot like what you're describing. So why don't you find out about Arupe? So that's how it started there, and it went on from there. I contacted uh, Father Garanzini, who was then the president of Lola. Uh, we actually uh, ran into each other in February 2014 at the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities uh, annual meeting. He gave me your name and phone number. And I still remember our first conversation. It was in February, 2014. And I have a visual memory. So anything that has had an impact on my life, I have a visual image of it. And I was in a hotel room in South Florida. I was attending uh, a board meeting. 
And I still remember that room. I remember pacing up and down that room because I was so excited about the conversation with you. And uh, it all started there and you know, here we are today. Very exciting. And I remember that conversation as well. I can remember thinking, you know, I don't know if this, if this model is going to work, but I'm <laughs> glad that you're enthusiastic about it. So let's talk a little bit about the model that, you know, you have done so well with at Doherty Family College. What about the model do you find compelling? You know, what I find compelling is it's so student-centered. And I think the model really adopts all best practices in terms of ensuring that all students can learn. I think the cohort piece of the model is very important. I think students learn, um, learn a lot from their peers. And I think their peers, they hold each other accountable in that cohort model setting. And they have, a, they have an immediate community. Of course, I think the comprehensive and, and culturally sustaining uh, support services, uh, all of the things that we do to get the barriers out of the way uh, for our students to be successful. So whether it's, you know, providing laptops or books or transportation or meals or, you know, ensuring that uh, if a student is paying tuition, that it is a feasible uh, amount. On, on average, our students pay about a thousand a year, but getting, getting the barriers out of the way, giving them that cohort model, and then giving them that, I would say, culturally sustaining and culturally affirming environment and that asset approach to pedagogy. We view that every student that walks in our door brings assets, not deficits. And we're looking to identify those assets and nurture those assets and celebrate those assets. So that's what I really find most appealing. Yeah, I talk a lot about the deficit narrative versus the asset narrative. And you probably know this about me. When we first started, we would interview students and we'd say, oh, tell us about an obstacle that you've experienced. What was it? And how did you deal with it? And what did you learn from it? And um, how did you resolve it? And of course, we were looking for grit and perseverance and resilience. But of course, the, the implicit message was, oh, you're first gen. Oh, you yeah. are... Um, yeah from a low wealth background, you must have um, obstacles. And mm -hmm. we flipped it to the assets where we say, we have a great community here. And we think, you know, just looking at your application and your essay and what your you know, high school teachers have said about you, you have some gifts and talents that will, already make, that will make an already great community even better. So that's tell us, that, you know, that's the asset narrative. Uh, and, you're, and you're affirming those students. And, and you're affirming in a way that develops their own confidence and, and their own agency. And it's just, it's wonderful to watch it happen. So Julie, I have this vivid memory of you bringing your board from mm -hmm. the Twin Cities to Arupe in Chicago. And I met, you know, I met with them and um, I think it was kind of there that, you know, your board said, let's go forward with this, you know? Um, that that was it's compelling. So, you know, starting this model of a college is it's a big financial commitment, mm -hmm. and it makes a lot of folks in higher ed leadership and including board members nervous. So, what was your experience about <laughs> dealing with that nervousness? And God, how did you grow your endowment so quickly? Well, I, I recall that trip to Arupe too very vividly, and that's when my board got first excited about it. And I recall uh, Father Monk Malloy, who's on our board, uh, being in, involved in that trip. And the really the, the testimonials of the Arupe students that we met that day, that's what sold. I mean, that's what, you know, they shared their experience and what they are learning. And so our board immediately said, yes. And we had some faculty with us as well. This is our purpose. This is what we want to do. But you're right, the financial piece of it was very important from the beginning. And they didn't say yes to it until we got the financial piece in place. In fact, they did not formally vote on this until November, let's see, 2016, I think it was, uh, because we had to have a financial commitment that ensured that this would not take resources from other parts of the university. Now, we had the commitment by the board that we would 
cover indirect things. We would provide space, we would share services, all of those things. But <clears throat> the board insisted that the direct costs of the college, we had to fundraise for. And so I really needed a, a lead gift. And fortunately, uh, two people really kind of made that happen. The first person uh, was the chair of our board and he had long been involved with the Cristo Ray Network. In fact, his sister had been really the, the impetus behind the, uh, the founding of the Cristo Ray School here in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So he stepped up as a role model. But I needed that really, that naming gift to get us over the hurdle. And we had a board member, Mike Doherty, who um, St. Thomas gave him a second chance in life. He had, he had experienced a number of challenges, but he also had a number of assets. And St. Thomas gave him that chance and he had a very um, uh, lucrative and successful career. So he was sold because of the emotion of knowing what St. Thomas had done for him when very few people believed in him. And so I agreed to meet the, Mike and his wife for coffee, Mike and Kathy. And Mike gave me the best piece of advice in my entire life. He said, don't even look at me in the conversation. Don't even talk to me in the conversation. Talk to Kathy. <laughs> and at the end of that conversation, they went home and they called me shortly afterwards and said they wanted to do it. So, and that happened, I mean, really within, oh, two to three weeks of our board vote. So I, I was kind of up to a time crunch on getting this commitment. That is a great story. Oh, and hence the Doherty Family College. Yes, because, and they were very, and they have two daughters, two grown daughters, and of course, a number of grandchildren. Their two daughters are on the board, on the advisory board, and it really is a family commitment. Uh, to the Doherty Family College. So you enrolled your first class in the fall of 2017, if I remember yes. correctly. Is that right, right sir? Yep. All right. So your first four years, you know, what, what are some of the outcomes that you've seen in terms of graduation rates, in terms of students getting their associate degrees at Doherty Family College and then going on uh, to a four-year institution like St. Thomas? Sure. Well, I'll tell you what those rates are and what we aspire for them to be and what I'm and what I'm certain they will be. Uh, clearly, COVID has given us a little hiccup in uh, growing our enrollments and increasing these rates, but we're still on track. So right now we're having about a 60% two year graduation rate on average. Uh, that compares though to 31% in the two year colleges of Minnesota and that's the 31% is a three year rate. So we have about a 60% two-year rate. Now we aspire to, and we'll, I'm sure, get that up to 80%, an 80% two-year graduation rate is in our uh, five-year strategic plan. Uh, in terms of going on to four-year institutions, of our DFC graduates, 70% of them are, are actively in or have graduated from a four-year institution. And we will push that up to 85% over the next five years. So we're really excited Outstanding. about that. But you know, the ultimate measure of our success, and you and I have talked about this many times, is graduation from that four-year institution with meaningful employment and on a path to a fulfilling career and, and, and prepared to be a civic leader in our community. So we have also set that 70% of the DFC graduates would finish their four-year degree in four to five years after graduating from DFC. And sometimes it does take five years because of, we can talk about that in a moment, depending on their major and, you know, the DFC curriculum does focus primarily on kind of a general liberal arts core curriculum. And uh, depending on their major, they may need to be taking some more specialized courses early on. Yep. Those are great numbers and great aspirations. I know that DFC is part of um, St. Thomas's overall 2025 mm -hmm. strategic plan uh, that, you know, so why was that important for you and for the, you know, strategic planning committee and for the university in, in, in general? Well, because DFC is a very, very important part of our mission. And 
And while we're happy with the success we've had, we feel like there's far more success to come. And we want to make sure that we're continuing to identify it as a strategic priority. So we want to continue to grow enrollment. We want to continue to increase those retention and graduation rates, whether it's from DFC or a four-year institution. But we also want to make sure that we're providing multiple pathways for those students to uh, transition to into St. Thomas. So we really want to build that pathway if they want to major in a STEM field, if they want to major in business, if they want to major in nursing or public health or some of our other health fields, how do we get them started on taking some of those courses in their two years at DFC so they have a more seamless transition and, and they can for sure be finished in four to five years uh, with their bachelor's degree. So we're really working out those paths right now. Uh, and uh, we feel quite confident because we have a number, number of students who want to study those disciplines. And we are Julie. finding that it's really important in recruiting students that we're not talking about come to DFC for two years and then go somewhere else. Their, their parents want to see a, com a completed pathway that's laid out for them. Now, they might elect to go somewhere else, but they want to see that if they started at the university, at the Doherty Family College, at the University of St. Thomas, there is a pathway with no hurdles for them to earn that four-year degree from the University of St. Thomas. Well, that's great. And that indicates that your students at DFC uh, have developed an affinity for the larger university. They have found community there mm -hmm. and the key ingredient, they feel like they belong there. Right. So they want to right. continue. That says a lot about uh, the University of St. Thomas. Tell me, how has the, the larger university responded to Doherty Family College and to uh, DFC students? Marvelously. In fact, uh, I frequently hear the phrase, uh, the Doherty Family College makes us a better university. Having those students a part of our community makes us a better, richer, stronger community. Uh, our DFC students are becoming student leaders during the time they're at DFC and then as they transition into the four-year program. We have DFC representation on our student government. Uh, that we have DFC representation in our club sports and in all of our uh, social and um, you know, special interest clubs. So, that was really important from the start. Our faculty felt very strongly that our Doherty Family College students not feel like they weren't fully a part of the University of St. Thomas. That's so great. We've, we've had that as part of really our strategy in designing the program from day one. They are 100% Tommies. In fact, we have a when they're accepted to Doherty Family College, they get the same purple T-shirt that says, I'm in that every you know, freshman that's accepted into our four-year program gets, because they're a Tommy. Wow, what a great uh, shot in the arm for a student, a high schooler. You know, you've got such a, a strong a brand identity, so positive brand nationally, but certainly in the Twin Cities. So a point of pride for these high schoolers to say, I'm going to St. Thomas, I'm going to a college mm -hmm. at St. Thomas. Um, you know, like me, I know that you have dozens, if not maybe scores, maybe hundreds of favorite uh, Doherty Family College memories so far in the four plus years that you've had students. Anything that comes to mind that you'd like to share with, um, you know, our viewers, our listeners? Um, well, the first graduation was phenomenal. I mean, everyone was in tears and we had faculty and staff come from throughout the university that you know, were not, did not work at DFC, to really be there to support those students and those families. And it was wonderful to see the large extended families come to that graduation and how proud they were of, of their children, of their siblings, of their grandchildren, of their nieces, nephews, whatever it might be. Uh, that first graduation was phenomenal. I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. Uh, a couple other poignant memories. I tell you one that really got me, but I'll always remember this. Uh, the first parent open house that we had. Uh, so it's just been a week or two into uh, the beginning of our first class. And a father of a student came up to me and uh, 
She uh, has graduated, is doing very well, has graduated from St. Thomas. She was a DACA student. He came up to me and he said, this is wonderful. My daughter's gonna do very well, but you told me your measure of success is graduating with a four-year degree. How are you gonna make that possible for her? How are you gonna remove the financial barriers so that she can continue beyond Doherty Family College? And he was like, you know, in my face. And I said, okay, <laughs> I've, got a, I've got another yoke on my shoulders. We've got to make this possible. I mean, he did it in a constructive way, but it was very, you know, it was very poignant. So, uh, but I, I'm just so proud of, I think mostly it's watching our DFC students mature, gain confidence, become leaders, really have their own agency. Um, I mean, those are the most fulfilling moments. Amen to that. So Julie, you know what I'm about. I mean, I left Arufe over a year ago to start the Come to Believe Foundation and Network. And, you know, we want more DFCs. We want more Arufes. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time with um, higher ed leaders nationally who um, are thinking about or exploring or looking at what you know, you and your colleagues have accomplished at University of St. Thomas, what's been done at Arupe. So what would you say to, you know, one of your fellow uh, university presidents who's considering starting um, a two-year college like DFC, like Arupe at their campus? Uh, I would tell them it will be your legacy and it will be one of the most important things that you've ever done. And, um, that's certainly how I feel. My husband and I have an endowed scholarship at the Doherty Family College. And to tell you how important it is to us, when my mother gives us Christmas gifts or birthday gifts, it's checks made out to Doherty Family College. <laughs> so uh, that's how important it is to us and our family and everyone in our family knows it. Wow, that's a great endorsement. All right. Um, anything, um, any, any, uh, any parting lines before we, we say uh, farewell here? Well, the world needs more uh, opportunities, more pathways for students to realize their full potential. And this is a pathway that we know that can contribute to that. So I hope we'll see many more. Julie Sullivan, president of the University of St. Thomas and uh, such a great advocate for students, such a maker of opportunities, and the visionary that you know your your enthusiasm and your energy and your determination led the creation of Doherty Family College. Thanks for for the conversation today. Uh, thank you, Steve. My pleasure. Uh,